Hello, welcome to Revenant Reads. I'm Vin, and this is a June on the Range edition of Fresh Red Kills. So June on the Range is a booktube event that was created by Michael K. Vaughn, uh, and it really is a celebration of reading westerns. Um, I did not have a lot of experience with reading westerns, uh, I had read Charles Portis's True Grit a few years ago, and I actually really like that. And I do like Westerns overall. Um, I'm, an, I'm an East Coaster, New Englander. Uh, I have not really had much experience at all with the West, with the real West. I've had no experience. I've been as far west as Chicago so far. Um, so I've not been in the, the West. Um, but, you know, I grew up on Western films, and uh, I like the genre overall. And I was excited to dive into some books. Um, so I read two books for June on the Range. Uh, Louis L'Amour's Dark Canyon and Michael Crichton's Dragon Teeth. Um, so I read this one first. Louis L'Amour, uh, I think undoubtedly the most famous Western writer and certainly one of, one of the most prolific and successful American writers of all time, I think. Um, although, you know, I have to admit that before I read this uh, and really before this booktube event, I only kind of knew of him at all in passing. Uh, but I can see after reading this why he was so popular. Um, this is one that I found, I was at Walmart. Uh, you know, I was surprised to find a Louis L'Amour novel there. Um, so I grabbed this. It's pretty short. I think it's like 160 pages. Yeah. Um, and, you know, his writing is swift. Uh, the plot just, you know, it starts with momentum and it never lets up. Um, and I can see why he's so popular and why, yeah, his, this novel at least, um, there was a certain cinematic quality about it. Uh, you know, it, it seems like a writer who was influenced um, as much by Western film as he, I'm sure, influenced Western film in turn. And this is the story of Riley, um, a young man who... Uh, whose father was killed at one point, um, and he ends up joining a gang of outlaws, but really they're outlaws with hearts of gold, uh, and they convince him basically to get out of the outlaw business before things get too dangerous. So Riley buys a plot of land, and he's trying to build himself a ranch, uh, and he kind of gets involved in a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of Hatfield and McCoy situation going on. Uh, this rival factions within a town, um, and one of them is basically using him, or attempting to use him as a pawn in this battle. Uh, and meanwhile, his outlaw friends come to help him, but they are also being hunted. And, you know, how are things going to work out for everybody? Um, and this was a pretty, I mean, this was a, a swift, like I said, satisfying experience. Uh, I was always eager to pick it up again, to keep on going. Um, so, you know, just over the course of a few pages, the story can move quite a bit. Uh, but it was great. Uh, you, you know, you can see those moments where you see, um, you know, there's an obstacle and of course they get, they overcome it, they resolve it. Uh, you can almost hear the cinematic score <laughs> rising when these moments are happening, you know, inside your head. Um, I was interested to see, because this was published, I think, in the early 1960s originally. Uh, let's see, 63 is when this one was originally published, I believe. And um, how certain aspects of the West would be depicted. Uh, we have our, our, of course, our gunfighters. Um, we have our outlaws. Uh, we have... Um, there aren't really Native Americans depicted here. Uh, they are spoken of more in a ghostly fashion. Like, their, their ruins haunt the land. Uh, they can feel their, you know, the presence in the fact that they know that they had once been there, but they are no longer there. Um, so, <clears throat> that's how we see Native Americans. Uh, the only other minorities that we see in here, there are at least two different Mexican characters. And they are shown overall positive. Um, they are seen as exceedingly loyal to uh, their white employers. Um, and they are not really seen as you know, men with any kind of sexual drive. Uh, but overall, they're seen as very cunning, very smart, uh, very difficult to fool, um, and certainly somebody who is formidable and also, like I said, uh, a devoted friend to have. Um, so a little, little bit of give and take with that, I would say. Um, but uh, overall, very positive depictions. 
And, uh, you know, it, like I said, it, it's fun. My only gripe would be the ending is a little bit, is wrapped up a little bit too neatly. Um, you know, it's, the big thing is going to be what's going to happen to these outlaws. And there's kind of a little bit of a, uh, gee whiz, aw shucks, you know, let bygones be bygones sort of thing going on. Um, essentially what Louis L'Amour has to very carefully skirt is the idea that in order for these outlaws to have been robbing all those banks and those trains and those wagons uh, over years, that not only would they have financially ruined uh, who knows how many people, but there had to have been people who were killed. Um, there had to have been people who died during this and who were murdered. Um, and he just kind of doesn't mention that stuff. Uh, at one point when Riley's part of the gang, he like shoots uh, like a sign or a post, something that's near somebody just to get him to duck. Um, you never see them actually shooting people and killing them. Uh, so we're just supposed to assume that these outlaws were successfully robbing people over the years. Um, and they weren't like, they weren't in a position where they ever had to murder somebody. Uh, so that's the only thing, you know, it, it's, Lou and just basically has to not go there. Um, and just hopefully that you don't imagine how a real bank robbery would actually you know, take place. Uh, and if you can do that, you can have fun with this. So, um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely would not mind, you know, picking up more Louis L'Amour, especially if there's another event like this, uh, next year, which I hope there will be. I would certainly pick up another Louis L'Amour book. Um, not great literature, but certainly, uh, a great fun read. And the other thing that I read for June on the Range, like I said, is Michael Crichton Dragon Teeth, which, uh, published posthumously, uh, after Crichton's death. I think this is like the third one or something like that that was published after he died. Um, <clears throat> I have only read a little bit of Crichton. I mean, I've read Eaters of the Dead. I think mean, that's actually it, um, which I really like. And I just started rereading that, actually, uh, for the end of the month, um, just because it got me thinking about it again. Uh, so I don't have a lot of experience with his writing, and I didn't know what to expect from this, honestly. Um, this is... It is a western, uh, but instead of we have instead of having like this cunning gunslinger, um, it's more of a fish out of water story. We have a New England Yale student. Um, actually, well, it's no, he's from Pennsylvania, but he goes to school in New England, so he, he becomes a student at Yale, and because of a, a bet that he makes, he ends up going out west with a professor who actually did exist, Marsh, um, to look for dinosaur fossils. So this is in the late 1800s, I think 1870s, maybe. Um, and he becomes involved in what's known as the Bone Wars, um, a rivalry, sometimes very violent rivalry, between two paleontologists. Uh, you have uh, Marsh and, I can't remember what the other name was here, uh, Cope. Yeah, Edward Drinker Cope. Um, these two paleontologists of very different uh, personalities, different means, different uh, motivations in some ways, both dedicated to paleontology, but um, their similarities kind of end there. And uh, they are sometimes relentless in trying to bring the other person down. And he becomes embroiled in this and in the middle of it. Um, and that's part of this whole thing, uh, is the bone horse. But then it starts going off uh, to, to some other um, aspects where um, the second half of the book, he's kind of mostly on his own, and he ends up uh, in Deadwood um, and meeting people like uh, Wyatt Earp and becoming involved, you know, a conflict with a, a pretty serious outlaw and um, how he's going to get out of that. Uh, he comes under attack from Indians, um, but he also has an Indian guide with him. So we see two sides of Native American culture there. Um, and I thought that Crichton, actually, we see this character change uh, throughout, the, throughout the book. Um, I thought Crichton did actually a really good job. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by this whole thing. Um, it starts off pretty strong, and it's, it's a book that has a lot of propulsion to the story. It is constantly moving. You really don't know where it's going to go next. Um, he incorporates certain aspects in the time period really, really well. Uh, you can just see Crichton's love of both history and science in this. Um, the stuff that, of course, he would go on to create that would mix those things. Um, his love of you know, things like paleontology uh, and, you know, dinosaurs, 
which of course won Jurassic Park. Um, his fascination with, you know, even like things like photography during that time, but also the history of the time period. And those are two things that I also love. I love history and science, and I love the way that Crichton molds those things together uh, in a very, very satisfying way. Um, we, we essentially have uh, three conflicts going on in this story. Um, we have the Bone Wars, of course, between Cope and Marsh, um, their combat. We have the U.S. Army versus Native Americans. Uh, this is right around when Custer gets taken out as well. Um, so that's going on in the background of all this. Um, we do see some historical figures uh, throughout this as well. It's a lot of fun. Um, and the other, the, the third conflict that we see is religion versus science. Because, because of course, uh, this runs right directly into the theory of evolution. And we see people who are hostile to that. Um, so, you know, not tolerant at all of uh, what some people are suggesting these bones uh, must mean. Um, so those three conflicts are constantly, you know, uh, being circulated throughout the story. And again, in very, very good ways. Um, you get a sense of the geography of the areas. Creighton has a great way of painting a picture and letting you imagine the scene uh, and what's going on, where people are. Uh, some really good dialogue in here as well, distinct characters. Um, and uh, it, I think it was written in the early 70s um, is when he actually wrote this. During Vietnam, which I thought, yeah, there's at one point where uh, as he is traveling east, uh, he is seeing the way that um, the war with the Native Americans out west is being depicted. Uh, as he moves more and more towards the east, there's more sympathy for the Native Americans because, of course, they are not there in the thick of the Americans dying. Um, and you saw some resentment from the American soldiers in the West about, you know, how they, people in the East did not seem to appreciate what they were doing or understand what they were doing or they vilified them. Um, and I couldn't help but think if uh, Crichton was drawing upon what was going on with Vietnam at that time and anti-war protests and the way soldiers were feeling uh, when they were coming home, uh, being called baby killers, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't help but think of maybe some influence from his own time bleeding into here. Uh, but yeah, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, this was a fun one. Um, so yeah, kind of a fish out of water story and the transformation of a, of a quiet Yale student into, uh, you know, a, a true Wild West, um, you know, gunslinger, essentially. Uh, and then we got Louis L'Amour, very short, uh, fun novel. Um, I would recommend both of these. I had great fun with both of them. So again, for June on the Range, I read Louis L'Amour, Dark Canyon, and Michael Creighton, Dragon Teeth. And if you read either of these, I'd love to hear your thoughts. As always, thank you, Booktube.